Hello, I'm Beaver Felton for Super Shots for Bass, still, and welcome to Beginner Bass Part 2. Okay, today we're going to cover, it's going to be kind of a continuation, an expansion, a graduation, if you will, of all the things that we covered on Part 1, as well as a bunch of new things. We're going to talk about harmonics, such as, I'm going to show you how to do those. Oh, by the way, we're still using Angelo Giannotti, as we did on Part 1, and I'm going to go through some other things that... Uh, uh, we also used on part one, once again, at an advanced level, which I guess means Angelo is better now than he was on part one. I don't know. But that was some blazing uh, solos going on. Now wasn't it Angelo? Okay, so much for that. He's paying me, by the way. Um, technique exercises. We're going to do that. More left and right hand technical exercises. A more aggressive way to uh, improve and develop your technique during your practice routines that I guarantee to work. I'm going to expand on neck familiarization, give you another method to use uh, in conjunction with, along with the method we used on part one. It's a little bit more demanding. Um, we're also going to look at more, uh, well, like I said, harmonics earlier. I'm going to show you how to execute them. Also, more importantly, uh, I'm going to show you a small melody you can use playing just harmonics. But of most relevance to you, I'm going to show you how you can use harmonics to tune your instrument. And this is an alternative method uh, in addition to the way we did it on part one. Now, once again, I'm going to give you a more demanding way of uh, learning the notes on the neck. As far as uh, music terminology, I'm going to be using a bunch of new terms today, which uh, you can add to your vocabulary. Also, speaking of vocabulary, we're going to expand your scale vocabulary with pentatonic, major, and minor scales. I'm also going to work on visualization. Now, I'm not talking about anything like a guru would do or anything like that, but uh, having to do with spotting intervals, recognizing intervals without having to count through the scales and all that. That has to do with neck visualization. We'll go through that, and that is also good, as well as a few other things we're going to do today, uh, as far as ear training. It helps develop your musical ear, hearing certain intervals. The more you do it, like a lot of other things, the, the better you get at it. Let's see, what else? I'm also going to teach you some chord construction. And this is important theory, even if you never play a chord on bass because you're going to see the correlation between the bass lines I play and the chords that Angelo or your guitar player or keyboard player uh, use and see the relationship between the two and the relevance of it. This is real important, very important, especially when it comes time to create your own bass lines, say when you're writing music next week or so. I'm going to give you an introduction to the slap technique, which is that kind of thing. Now, that's the technique. I'm going to expand on it further, and to be frank, it's going to require an entire video just to go over the elements of it. And not by coincidence, I'm going to be coming out with a Learn to Slap video in a couple of months. But to whet your appetite or pique your interest, so to speak, I'm going to give you just a very basic rudimentary pattern to get you started at that. So that'll be good. And I, once again, I want to stress the importance of learning a lot of different styles and techniques. Uh, I'm sure Angelo could vouch for this. There's times when you can get a gig uh, or the difference in getting or not getting a gig is whether you know how to play this style of music. Not a matter of talent or how hard it is, but just being versed in a lot of different things. So versatility, let me just go ahead and underline, is a real important thing. Okay, time signatures. We're going to look at some more time signatures. I'm going to get you used to playing in different fields and also different rhythmic values. We're going to go into triplets, which feel totally different than their straight counterparts. What else? Practice methods, a very aggressive way to, uh, to improve your technique, once again. Uh, using the metronome, and I'll outline that later. Also, you're going to need a pad and pen, so you might want to grab that. Also, let me say this. On part one, I stress the importance of having a tuner and a metronome. Metronome is first priority. If you don't have it, once again, put the VCR on hold, pause, turn it off, go down to your nearest music store and get a metronome of some type because it's mandatory. Now, I haven't said that. One more thing, dynamics and accents. I'm going to teach you about that. The point there is it's not just that you play X amount of notes in a certain sequence, it's how you play it. It adds a lot to the overall uh, musical result. Okay, and also uh, we're going to be doing more basic patterns. And I've actually allotted more time at the end of this video for those bass patterns so that you can get uh, a little bit more versed at different feels, different locations of the neck, different time signatures, uh, different key signatures, playing out of different shapes and scales and key signatures and or triads on the neck. Once again, trying to make you more versatile of a player and well-rounded, and I can't emphasize this enough. 
Okay, I'm using the same gear, and of course, once again, same guitar player as I did on part one. Carbon bases, GHS strings, hip shot detuner, Kaler Wang bar system. How's this for fast? And uh, uh, Sabine tuners and metronome, ART effects. And of more relevance to you, I talked in part one about how you ex can uh, use an extension speaker cabinet in the Combo 150. Now, you can't hear it really because I've got a direct feed off the amp, but when you hook up an additional cabinet, for example, if you use the 110 model like this, what I would recommend and suggest if you want to expand on that is uh, a 115 bottom. What this does is, is it gives you another 50 watts power output, more volume, louder, more headroom, cleaner sound, more volume overall, a lot more speaker coverage, a lot more sound coverage. And plus, you've got a combination of little and large speakers, which makes for a, a really wide frequency response range, lows, mids, and highs. Now, had you opted for the 115 model, which is to the side of that, by the way, let me, uh, Mike, if you would come up here and move these, uh, these bases, you can see the cabinets a little bit better. Mike Atkinson, my friend and bass tech for the day, and up and coming guitar player to boot. Um, now, that has a 15 in it. And if you were to have chosen that, I would recommend the Carvin 410 and tweeter cabinet. Once again, you got all the same pluses that you do with this, except, well, along with, once again, using a combination of large and small speakers, and you even got a tweeter. And actually, even more cone area if you go in that route. So, there you have that. And I can guarantee that you're not going to outgrow these guys in the first six months that you're playing. Okay, having said that, let's move on to section one. Okay, now let's deal with harmonics. Harmonics are the high things that uh, you hear on guitar or bass. Such as that. Now, um, first I want to show you how to execute harmonics. These are reliant, that's reliant upon two things. How you touch it, sensitivity if you will, and where you touch it. So let's look, first look at how you touch it. A harmonic is where you just barely touch it with the left hand. You don't press anywhere near hard enough to fret the note, such as, or you're just going to barely touch the string. And when you execute a harmonic properly, you can do one of two things. You can leave your finger there or take it off, like that. Now, um, as far as where, when I say fourth fret harmonic, I'm talking about right over the fret wire, not between the frets, which is, uh, would be the case if you're fretting the note. So your easiest and strongest harmonics are over the 4th, 5th, 7th, 9th, and 12th frets. Now let's look at a, just a quick melody, just so you get kind of a... This will be a good exercise, and interesting, really. Sound familiar? Taps or Reveille or something, wake up. I don't know what, it's mean, what it means. Okay, here's the... Real quickly, and you have it in front of you on the tab as far as the timing, but this is real simple. Watch, I'm playing over only the 5th, 4th, and 7th frets, and if you just uh, pay attention, you'll see exactly what order. Repeat. Repeat. Then for the last three notes. And there you have that. Now, as an added uh, note, let me say that harmonics come out much stronger if you roll your, your bass onto where it's just a, just a rear pickup. If you have a volume knob for each one, roll the front pickup off and the rear pickup all the way on. If you have a pan control, like I do on the carbon, go to just the rear pickup, that position. Okay, now let's look at uh, harmonics in regards to tuning the bass. Let's say, just like in any tuning scenario, you first establish that the G string's in tune. Like that. Now, the seventh fret harmonic produces a D note. So does the fifth fret of the D string. So if you play those simultaneously, they should sound like that. Now this is where the Doppler effect comes in. I don't want to get into too much weird theory or anything, but the Doppler effect is such that if the notes are equal, then you won't really hear this vibrato or wavering type, uh, waveform type sound. However, I'm going to detune my D string a little bit to show you what it sounds like, and hopefully it'll come through the uh, video. Now, check it out. You should hear a vibrato. Check it out. 
Now, the further you are from being in tune, the faster that vibrato gets. The closer you get to in tune, as you're going to hear, slows down, slows down even more. And then finally, when you're on the money, Now, piano tuner will say uh, one waveform every seven seconds is satisfactory or tolerable. So, if you want to use that as a guideline, and always go back and check it with your tuner. Now, let's do this. And by the way, when you're executing the fifth fret of the D string, you got to be sure to curve your finger. If you were looking at, at the, if the camera were sitting right here and you were looking down, you would see that I'm curving my finger over so as not to interfere with the vibration of the G string, as opposed to which is killing the, uh, the G string. So you gotta pluck them like that. And that's the good thing about it, is it frees both hands so you can tune while both notes are, are sustaining. Okay, use the same formula across the neck. Seventh fret of the D string should equal the fifth fret of the A. And the seventh fret of the A should equal the fifth fret of the E. So once again, the same formula holds true, going in either direction. Once again, let me reiterate, start out by making sure that whatever string you start on is in tune up to pitch. Now, having said that, I want to talk about another method. I call this the flashcard method of learning the notes on the neck. Okay, in part one, we talked about going up or back alphabetically. But here's the one downfall to that. Say if you're in a jam or you go and somebody says, okay, the chords are G, F, and A. And you say, okay, confidently, uh, I know where those are. And you go. E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, blah, blah, blah. In other words, you want to get to the point where you don't have to count up or back. You want to spot and recognize that note all over the neck. So here's my prescription. Let's pick a note first at random, hence the flashcard approach. Uh, let's say a B, a natural note. First, and you can even have, have a pad and pen for this, which some of my students have done, and it's been very effective. Write down the note, say, for example, B and find out on each string where that note is. First, let's look at one location per string. B, seventh fret E. I'm helping you out on this part. Second fret A. Seventh, wow. Seventh fret of the, uh, or rather ninth fret, there we go, of the D string and the fourth fret of the G. Now let's take it a step further and go through it back and forth and name the note as you're doing it. Now let's take it a bit more aggressively. Let's go up one octave. You ought to always be able to see without counting that an octave is 12 frets. The last thing you want to do is one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, et cetera. You want to spot it. So use these markers that are on your neck very strategically. Uh, for example, learn where the third and fifth and seventh and ninth are. And then remember, after the 12th fret, everything duplicates. So you can use those markers in the same manner. But uh, just for continuity's sake, 7th fret, 7 plus 12 is uh, 19. So you're going to find that same note on the 19th fret. 2nd fret, plus 12 is 14. 9 plus 12 is 21. And back here, 16. So find that note at every location on the neck. Now pick another note, and this would be more like, uh, say it's not, make sure it's not like consecutive or right next to the note you picked begin, to begin with. Make it a little bit harder for yourself. A G, which is not very, you know, right next to a B note. Third fret, an octave higher, 15th. 10th fret, 22nd. 5th, 12th, or rather 15th, 17th. And then open, 12th, and if you have a 24 uh, fret neck, you can actually play three Gs on the G string. So here, there you have that. Once again, go forward, backward, recite it, look at it, write it down with pad and pen if you have to. Repetition is the name of the game. So, okay, now let's look at interval recognition. This is getting more into, uh, this will help you with ear development. And also, what I really want you to see is these intervals on the neck, and consequently, uh, uh, you'll, you'll start hearing them also. You'll start being able to hear if it's a major or minor interval the more you get used to playing it. So let's go back, let's trace this back to the major scale, which you already know because you have part one. Okay, 
Now, the uh, major scale, as I went over in part one, seven degrees, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the three major intervals, actually there's four, but I don't want to confuse you, are the main ones are the major third, major six, major seven. So let's take all seven of these intervals, and I want you to see them in relation to the root note on the neck. Okay, say if we're starting at any given note, let's use A for a reference. The major second is always two frets up on the same string, or four frets back on the adjacent string. B, B. Okay, let's look at the major third. It's always four frets up on the same string, C sharp, or one fret back on the adjacent string. These shapes hold true all over the neck. Okay, the perfect fourth, same fret, one string over. Perfect fifth, two frets up, one string over. The major six, one fret back on two strings over, or on the adjacent string, four frets up. Let's check it, F sharp, F sharp. Now the major seventh, I want to look at it a little bit differently. It's either one fret up, two strings over, or one fret below on the same string. In other words, you, these intervals can hold true below the root as well as above the root, and that's a, an important dis, uh, distinction to make, I think. Check it out. There's a G sharp, so is there. So in relation to A as a root, that's a major seventh, be it below or above the root. Now let's take the same thing and look at the minor scales and the minor intervals. Once again, learning them, you know, being able to spot and recognize them all over the neck. Once again, the minor scale. Okay, the second is the same. The minor third, three frets up on the same string as it is two frets back on the adjacent string. Yeah. Okay, now let's look at the minor sixth. Three frets up on the adjacent string. And you can always verify. One, two, three, four, five, six. Minor six. Six degree of the minor scale. Or two frets back on the two strings over. Now the minor seventh always is on the same fret, two strings over, or looking at it below the root as we did with the major seventh, two frets below the root. That's a G, and that's a G. So there you have that. And that's real important for you to uh, understand that. Now in this next segment, I'm going to need Angelo because we're going to go over triads. And I'll be right back. OK, now let's talk about chords. Uh, to begin with, a triad is a three-note chord, obviously. Um, and it usually consists, let's say, in a, the, the uh, context of a major triad. OK, think about this. This is correlating back to the major scale. It consists of the root, major third, and fifth from the major scale. Major triad from the major scale, one, three, five. The shape, as it looks on the, on the neck, if it, close up with the left hand, is this. As an exercise, go ahead and play it up to the octave and keep going through that. Just gets you used to seeing the shape on the neck. A, C sharp, E. Now, if you take it anywhere, say you start on a G, same shape, it's still a major triad. Once again, kind of like the major scale, doesn't matter if you move it around. What dictates what major triad it is, is what note you start on. G major, D major, etc. Okay, and as you could hear uh, against the major chord, it works. One more time, Ange, A major triad. Okay, now let's look at the minor triad. All you do is you use the same construction, root, third, and fifth from the minor scale. So you, the construction is actually root, minor third, fifth, and just for this exercise, I'm going to include the octave. That's not necessary. So watching the left hand fingering, let's uh, check this out. And I would use this stretch fingering. Once again, you can move that all around. Now let's look, go back to the major scale, or the major triad rather, and look at another shape or another way of performing that. Once again, this goes back to intervallic uh, relationships or recognition. Root, major third. You're just playing the third on the same string as the root. 
I want you to see that shape also. Now, using that same formula for the minor triad, it would be performed as. Let's see if I can get a better angle here. There you go, there's that. Now, just so you see the, the major difference, no pun intended, uh, there's a radical difference even though it's just one note. I'm going to let Angelo first play a minor triad and let me play that or chord and I'll play the minor arpeggio. By the way, an arpeggio is a chord played one note at a time. For example, here's a D major chord, here's a D major arpeggio. That's all it is. Okay, having said that, now Angelo's going to play uh, a minor, uh, an A minor and I'm going to play that uh, corresponding arpeggio. Okay, now what I'm going to do, once again, just to show how important knowing that third, which one it is, it's a make or break scenario as you're getting ready to find out. Angelo's going to play a minor triad like he just did, or minor chord, same difference, and I'm going to play an A or a major third in there, and you're going to hear a train wreck. Here we go. Okay, conversely, he's going to play a major, I'm going to play a minor. You can hear that he's playing that C sharp for happy tonality, and here I'm playing a, a C, and that's kind of what it sounds like together. So the point being that uh, knowing your triads and how they correlate to your guys' uh, chords really is important. Now, and that's going to be even more evident uh, when we get to the patterns towards the end of the tape, uh, which are going to incorporate some of those shapes. Okay, now let's move on to the next section. Okay, now let's look at some rhythmic theory. Let's start with time signatures. If you remember in part one, we talked a lot about 4-4, four, four, common time. Counted. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And that was four quarter notes to a measure. Now let's look at 3-4. Once again, the same formula. Now there's three quarter notes per measure. And here's what it would sound and feel like. If you want to uh, correlate it to something about like a waltz, that type dance or medieval thing that they did, that was in 3-4 time. Some people even refer to it as waltz time, and it sounds like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, etc. Now, say I were playing a bass line. It might fit, obviously, with that. Three quarter notes is what I was playing per measure. Now, let's look at 6-8, which has a similar feel. Now, normally, 6-8 is played, uh, not always, but usually, where the, the measure is divided in two halves, each with like three eighth notes, six eighth notes, six eighth notes per measure. And a lot of times, it's cut in half, so the feel's kind of like one, two, three, four, five, six, which is what I'm getting ready to do right about now. I'm going to change the tempo, and also I'm going to use a melody and teach you this melody, uh, which is probably going to be, well, depending on your age, it's probably going to be uh, somewhat familiar to you. Now, I've put an open height, open symbol to mark one, and then I'm dividing uh, the measure in half, as you'll see, with an open hi-hat. Here's the count for 6-8. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that melody, which is beautiful, is kind of like the main motif for a tune by Chicago ages ago called Color My World. Let me go ahead and show you that. And as you play it, even if you play it without a metronome or a, a, a drum machine, you'll establish that feel. I'm not even sure if that song's written in 6-8, but uh, I would imagine that it is, and it certainly could be. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's get a close up on the left hand as we do have and you'll see that what I'm playing, check it out, is just like a major triad but you're adding the major seventh on top then right back down the triad. So one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, I went through that twice then I changed the melody slightly by lowering the first or root note such as 
Everything else was the same. You might want to check out that song and learn the rest of the melody if you'd like. Uh, but that's the main feel, and I want you to establish that difference, be able to count and immediately feel the difference in 3, 4, and 6, 8 as opposed to 4, 4. Now, and if you want to get weird, you could have 7, 4, and we'll go into that on an intermediate lesson, which is something that Rush writes almost everything in. Great band. He uses a lot of odd time signatures. And when you get into 5, 4, and 7, 4, that's what that's known as, is odd time, or the way I call it, weird time. Now, let's look at triplets. Okay, going back to the quarter notes, or the note values that we went over in part one, if you remember, we played like quarter notes, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now, there's such a thing as quarter note triplets, in which case, the way to remember this is that in stri the, the straight uh, version of a note, like a quarter note, there's four. When you go to the triplet version, such as quarter note triplets, there's going to be more, in this case, six. Uh, and that would be three in the first half of the measure, three in the second half, six quarter note triplets per measure. But now let's focus, and this is going to be a little bit easier to subdivide, on um, quarter note, I mean, uh, eighth note triplets. Now, here's the way that goes. Keep in mind there's eight eighth notes in a measure of 4-4. Four, four. When you turn those into triplets, the way to subdivide it, or the way to think of it, is there's three eighth note triplets per quarter note. So you have to subdivide that each quarter note into three equal parts, underline that, equal. Now, I'm going to do that. I'm going to slow the tempo down a little bit. And actually what I'm going to do is change the, uh, the feel so that you can actually see. I've got a quarter note going on here with the, the hi-hat, but in between that is uh, the triplets are spelled out with just like a, a click, such as this. The quarter note count would be one, two, three, four. The triplets are counted in one of two ways. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. One, two, three. Or, when it gets old, or by taking the word triplet and subdividing that into three syllables, such as triplet, 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 triplet. And it's very important to make that distinction between the straight eighths and the triplet eighths. Okay, now, one more thing I want you to remember is this. When you're playing triplets, that doesn't, doesn't simply mean any time you put three notes in a given uh, space. For example, if we went back to quarter notes, and I played it, I'm squeezing three notes in between the quarter notes. But that does not constitute a triplet. That's more of a, an eighth note gallop. Or actually, sixteenth notes. Could be. Now, in this case, keep in mind that a triplet is even. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Establish that and go over it because at some point in your career, you're going to be playing things in triplets. It's good to know the feel and understand the, the mathematics behind it. Uh, okay, now let's move on and talk about dynamics. Say I was pat sit, playing a pattern like this. Now, we talked about playing things very evenly, like with the right hand, making both fingers sound the same. But if I wanted to make that pattern certain notes jump out more by using uh, accents, gives it a whole different impression. And so it, it's, uh, it becomes less like a machine and more like an emotional statement. Now, the point is, keep this in mind, sometimes things are meant to be played or should be played evenly, and other times you can phrase them, like I just said, using accents. Now, I'm going to show you uh, a way to develop that right hand uh, control using accents in just a minute. But let me continue on about dynamics. Say you're arguing with your girlfriend, or if you're a girl, your boyfriend, or whatever. You got highs and lows, dynamics. Um, where you're yelling and then you know, things are a little bit more calm, et cetera, et cetera. War time is the same. Everything in life is that way. Ups and downs. Dynamics, by definition. Now, when you apply that word to um, music, you're talking about different volumes. For example, the word crescendo means to start soft and get louder, not to be confused with slow and faster. And there's a strong distinction there. Let me do a kind of a crescendo here.
Okay, now while I've got you on the, uh, the uh, triplet thing here, what I'm going to do is show you a diminuendo. You can see in the crescendo I got soft to loud by f use changing the attack on my right hand. And that's what's going to really control this. Now I'm going to use the, the opposite effect. This is called a diminuendo, where it starts loud and gets softer, not to be confused with faster to slower. Here we go. Point made, hopefully. Now, let's look at learning that control with the right hand. What I'm going to do uh, is this. First, we're going to use uh, a left hand exercise, and the right hand also gets a workout. But uh, let's stay on this whole triplet thing for a few minutes. This is called the three by four. Remember the four by four. Four notes, four fingers, four frets per string across the board. Believe it or not, uh, this is actually a little bit harder because you're using every combination, three finger combination, available with these four fingers. And as we're going to find out, there's four possibilities, four permutations, if you will. Let's go back to, uh, let's see. We're going to keep this in triplet, so I'm going to keep a triplet feel here so you see the phrasing. And I'm going to do it pretty slowly, which is where you ought to start with anything new. And here it is. The first one is using fingers one, two, and three on frets five, six, and seven. And here it is. Across the board. things even. Count one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it. Okay, now let's take it to the second permutation. Using fingers two, three, and four, you're going to find this more difficult. That's why I want you to do it. Frets six, seven, and eight. Check it out. Be sure and repeat the high note to keep it in three, four. One, two, three, one, two, three. Etc. Now, I'm doing an abbreviated version of each of these, but what I want you to do is 30 seconds by the clock per combination. The next combination is finger, fingers one, two, and four. We're skipping a finger and a fret. Frets five, six, and eight. Here we go. Last but not least, predictably, is fingers one, three, and four. And this is probably the hardest combination. So I want you to, if anything, bombard this. Don't neglect it. Um, using frets five, seven, and eight, skipping one finger and the corresponding fret. You OK, Sean? OK. Two, three, four, five, six. Triple it. Here we go. Okay, by doing exercises like that, you're going to get, A, it's great for your left hand, your right hand is still getting a workout, and uh, you're developing that much more of a triplet feel, which is real important. And it's helping you work on your meter and, and timing and uh, accuracy. Now let's move to the right hand and look at uh, a couple of things. We'll be doing triplets. You're still going to alternate fingers one and two. That's uh, important to watch and make sure that you're paying attention to that. But we're going to first do it very evenly, then I'm going to introduce accents, which I showed you or demonstrated earlier. Say we're fretting just the fifth fret of the E string uh, with the left hand. Don't worry about that. It's the right hand maneuver. And you're going to see I'm playing very evenly just on the E string to begin with. Triple it, triple it. Now let's introduce an accent. Let's make it the first of every six groups, or uh, every six notes, such as. Once again with the right hand, just play a little bit harder with the first finger. 
One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now let's uh, expand on that and let's accent the first of every, every uh, triplet. In other words, the first one will be on the first finger, then the second group, or every alternative group, or alternating group rather, alternative groups, uh, primus, anyway, would be on the second finger, such as four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So there you have a, kind of a, at least something to get your feet wet at control and dynamics. Obviously I, I exercised a certain amount of dynamics in that run. There were certain notes I made stand out. And here you got some harmonics to mess around with. And if you learn that lick, don't even bother with the rest of the video. Okay, now, here's a method by which you can really develop, I guarantee it, your right and left hand technique. And what it calls for is a bass, of course, a metronomic device, a pad, a pen, and a calendar. A calendar so you know what day today is and tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here's the way it works. We're going to go back to, like, the 3 by 4 exercise. Although this works with every exercise, pattern, lick, scale, etc. You can use this formula throughout anything you do. But the, uh, the focus is to increase and develop the four aspects of technique. Let's see if I can remember these this time. Um, you've got strength, speed, endurance, and accuracy. All those are different uh, aspects of your technical ability. And they all kind of interrelate. And what you want to do is develop all four of them. So, the way it works is this. You write down what you can do at a given tempo or say a, an ex a given exercise. We're going to use the three by four just as a, uh, a reference. And I'll show you a pattern or a tempo that I can do it at. Let's say you can also do it at this. Well, maybe you can't. It's going to vary from person to person. But the point is, write down what you can do comfortably, accurately, for a full 30 seconds by the clock. That's where the endurance part comes in and strength. For example, and I'm not going to do a full 30 seconds, but here's the point. Okay, say if I could keep that up for 30 seconds at, and may, here's where the pen and pad comes into play, write down how fast you can do it, say 70. Now move the metronome up to let's just say 80. And I'm going to slop through this after about the first time, I'm going to uh, just uh, kind of uh, pretend that I can't do it, but I really can't. Darn. Okay, the point is, you need to find out what you can do and can't. Say 70 was good for 30 seconds with accuracy. 80, which I just went to, say I could do one time through, or let's say for conversation, say you could do it for 10 seconds accurately, and then you kind of poop out. Here's the way to practice it. Do it for those 10 seconds, and when you find, feel yourself faltering or whatever, stop for a couple of beats or a couple of seconds, pick it right back up, do another 10, stop, do another 10. Before you know it, think of it as like uh, rungs on a ladder or short-term goals. Before you know it, you've gotten up to 80 beats per minute um, for a full 30 seconds. Then you, you uh, keep raising the, uh, the goal to like 90 beats per minute. You can do it for 10, then 15, then 20, then 30 seconds. The, the, the uh, principle is just like lifting weights. Say so you do curls 10 with 50 pounds and then uh, you move up to 70 pounds and you can only do three. You increase either the poundage and or the repetitions and before you know it, you're doing 50 for 10 reps or three sets or what have you. So use that same principle and keep a written document of what you can and can't do. Then, you know, what your short-term short goal is. When you reach that, write down another thing to shoot for. And that's the way it works. Now, that was the left hand. Once again, you can apply it to anything. And I want you to make the uh, uh, distinction between the left and right because there will be exercises that your right hand can do easily, but your left hand's not up to, and vice versa. 
So I want you to do the same thing with the right hand. Let's go back to say the triplets. This is an excellent right hand exercise. And the bottom line really is push yourself. Let's say you can do it at 80 with just the right hand. The left hand is just staying stationary. Real even triplets. Okay, but let's say you move it up to 100. Now I'm just going to do it a few times and I'll play sloppy as if I can't. But I can. And hopefully you see the point. You have to be real critical with yourself and real objective and really be aware of what you can and can't do. I don't want you to, to put down 100 just so you can say you can do 100 if you can't. So that was like. Um, 100 beats per minute. So if I couldn't do that, in fact, for 30 seconds, that would be my first short-term goal, or maybe 95. Use the same principle for the left and right hand and applies to scales, patterns, licks, exercises, etc. Now, and I guarantee that'll help develop all four aspects of your technique. Now we're going to go to the next section where we're going to get into some pentatonic scales. Okay, now let's talk about some new scales for you. We're going to look at pentatonic scales. Penta meaning five, like pentagon, pentangle. There's probably some more pentas I can't think of at the moment. Like what? Penthouse. Penthouse. No, forget that one. Um, good, good going, Ange. Okay, first I'm going to show you the, the uh, pentatonic minor scale. Now, all these notes come from the, from the pure minor scale that we've done uh, on part one. But here's the construction starting on A. And I'll show you my left hand fingering as I call the notes. Uh, well, instead of the notes, what I'll do is, is give you the intervals. The actual construction is root, minor third, fourth, fifth, minor seventh. One, two, three, four, five. Now just to round it out, we're going to go ahead and do the octave. Ange is going to play an A minor chord, and you're going to see how this sounds against it. Keep going. And there you have that. Now I'm going to show you a second fingering for the same chord, or the same uh, scale rather. Slightly different on the left hand. We're just changing, and this goes back to interval recognition on the neck. All we're changing is the placement of the, uh, or location of the minor third. And here we have. Same intervals. I want you to practice both. It's a good left hand dexterity exercise and it's good to see them on the neck. Now let's look at the major pentatonic scale. The construction is root, second, major third, fifth, major sixth. Isn't it? <laughs> okay. In any event, and then just to complete the octave. And Andrew's going to play an A major chord, and you're going to see how it sounds over that. Oops. I like it. Okay, now these chords, or these scales are extremely, oh yeah, let me show you a second fingering just for continuity of that same scale. Zero in on my left hand, and you'll see. Oops. You can see that on tab in front of you. Same notes, just different placement. Once again, uh, more reinforcement for that neck familiarization and interval recognition. Okay, now what I want to do is this, and I'll probably get sued for this, I don't know. Here's a great melody. There's a lot of great guitar players, especially blues guys like Eric Clapton, that play a lot using the minor pentatonic scale. And just so you can see a, a really beautiful melody using that, let me go ahead and rip one off from him. First I'll play it, then I'm going to show it to you note by note in a slightly simpler manner because this has some phrasing and hammer-ons and slurs that uh, might be a little bit ahead of you for at this point in time. OK, 
Okay, let's look at the scale on the left hand here. This is D, or not harmonic, pentatonic minor scale. And the notes are D, F, G, A, C. We're not playing the octave, but that's the five notes. Now keep in mind that that, that uh, seventh, or the, the uh, last degree of that scale, the C note, is actually played below the root to begin with. In real simple terms, and see if I can get a click on this. There's a click. Let me slow this down and see if I can put it. Once again, I'm going to eliminate the, the phrasing and, and actual uh, feel of it, but I'm going to show you the notes because I think it's fun to play and you can hear it. Oh yeah, let me say this. The E note was, uh, is strictly speaking, it's a violation. Whoa, the, hopefully the scale police won't get me for that. But, uh, but uh, that is not found in the D uh, minor pentatonic. So that's an addition to it. One, two, three. I've done that obviously in a very robotic type stiff manner only because I really don't want to get too hung up on phrasing at this point I want you to be able to do this pattern and you can add the hammer-ons and slurs as you uh, accordingly as you have that technique okay the notes are five at a time again and it's on tablature the next five Repeat. The third section. Again. Then the last part. Again. Let me go ahead and show you what this is. With the left hand, you've got a trill of sorts. It's a hammer-on, followed by a pull-off. Okay. So you've got three notes, but you're only plucking the first one with the right hand. And so here's what's important to uh, develop on the left hand is the hammer-on has to be hard enough to produce that second note. Harder yet is the pull-off. You can't just lift the finger off like that. You don't get a strong enough third note or pull-off. You gotta like pull it towards the G string or towards the ground or towards China or somewhere. So all three. You might even use that as a miniature exercise. So there you have that. And once you've learned those five notes, if you want to add the slurs and the uh, hammer-ons, then uh, that's fine. So use that as a little miniature goal in, it, in and of itself. Okay, now let's move on. And I'm going to show you, before we get into the patterns, which are at the end, I'm going to show you a little bit of the slap technique. As I talked about earlier, this is a very involved technique. And I'm just going to show you the bare rudiments, the bare essentials, if you will of that technique. The first thing you need to be able to do is be able to just slap. Let's play an A note with the left hand, just fretting the fifth fret of the E string. And if you'll zero in on my right hand, you'll see I'm playing over the upper part of the fingerboard and using my wrist like a swivel. You know, you don't want to do this and you don't want to, you know, thumb it like that. That's almost like a, a downstroke. You're actually thumping it with this part of the thumb that part of the knuckle. Go for the sound, don't worry about the speed. You want a percussive. So that's step one. Okay, now let's zero in the on the left hand for a second, because this is super important. This is the single biggest hurdle to get over in this technique. And I can assure you, if you have patience, you can do so. You need to use what I call the lazy finger approach on the left hand, where you're laying these fingers very flat lightly across all the strings except for that note and string which you want to fret. For in, in this example, now this is pretty easy. It's going to get harder in just a minute. And that's to keep the other strings from ringing. Okay, now let's go back to the right hand and look at the next element. We've got the pluck. You're just reaching under there and literally plucking. Get your finger under there and pull the string away from the body. If you pull it too far, it'll probably break, and you're getting that percussive kind of sound. 
So just do that. Do each of these, say the thump for about a minute on the E string, and then the pluck on the D string, and I'm fretting the seventh fret, which is the A note octave. Now, let's look at the left hand one more time. And you'll see that while I'm plucking, I'm also using that lazy finger approach. The only note being fretted is right there. But the rest of these guys, they're tired and, <laughs> and they're just laying across all the other strings, consequently muting the other strings, which will haunt you as such. If you're not careful. Now let's put, now let's uh, up the ante a little bit. Let's go over and thump the same fret. And this is going to be harder. This is where the muting is going to really come into play. Um, on the A string, fifth fret A string, which is a D note, is what I'm thumping. So with the right hand, concentrate very hard on thumping just the A string. You don't want to hit the E or the D. But in the event that you do, you'll see on my left hand, that's where this lazy finger deal comes into play once again. And this is a little bit harder than playing on the E string because you've got to curve the second or middle finger over the A string as such without killing the A string note but while slightly dampening or muting the E string. So even though you can't see it probably from your angle, I'm fretting this note and everything else is just barely being muted. Okay, now let's plug the octave to that, which is the seventh fret of the G string. Okay, now let's combine these two exercises and put the thump and pluck octave together such as on the E and D string, this is the A note. You're seeing on the left hand the lazy finger approach in effect. Now what I'm doing with the right hand obviously is just Okay, move it over to the A and G string. Now this once again is where the left hand has to really reach over and kill the E string, keep it from ringing. As you can see, I'm doing the lazy finger routine, like that. Okay, and... Right hand. And there you have that. Now let's make a musical statement out of this. Um, let's go ahead and put a little bit of musical uh, movement with it using the same thing, same right hand formula, same left hand things, except we're just going to get a little movement such as, and let's put it with a click. All we're doing is playing the octave A, moving down to the F sharp, G, G sharp and A, just a chromatic thing. If you can keep in mind all the things that we've talked about up to this point, the proper uh, slapping and the proper, or thumping and plucking and the muting with the left hand, keeping the notes kind of short and uh, work on those things and you'll have a good head start on this technique. Okay, now let's move to the section. This will be the last section of the video and probably the most fun where we're playing patterns, and I'll teach them to you. As on uh, part one, we're going to go through a short version and a long version of each of these patterns. They're going to be in different fields, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the first one, uh, you're going to get a chance to exercise or use the triad shapes that we learned about 20 or 30 minutes ago. And the chords, for your information, that Angelo is going to be playing are B minor, A major, G major, and you thought you couldn't play chords on bass. Then back up to A major. And here is the pattern. Okay, once again, the triads. Over the B minor, I played the same as the B minor arpeggio or triad that we did earlier, I think. And it looks like all the way up to the octave. These are just quarter notes, so the count is simply one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one
two, three, four. And there's your notes. When we played, when Angela went to the A chord, I simply played holding those notes legato, as you should remember from part one video. Then we move down to the G major. I use the G major triad shape. The first time through, I went to the low G. Then back up to the A, playing it the same in the same manner. The second time, I repeated everything except, just for variation, I went up and played the high G instead of the low G, then back up to the A, same thing. Then when I ended it, I just went. Okay, now what we're going to do, as in part one, is I'm going to play, we're going to go through this pattern eh, probably twice, uh, or four times actually, through the chord progression. Just now we did two, now we're going to double that. So the first time, I'll play it, and then the second time, you play it, along with drums and Angelo. Just think, you get to play with a guy that's going to be on Guitar on the Edge 6. Here we go. Okay, now for the next pattern, what I'm going to do is something with an entirely different feel and tonality. We're going to move around to, and by the way, that was out of like, if you had to look at a key signature, you'd probably look at that as like B minor, that last progression. Now let's look at something that's going to be based out of uh, D major, and if you recall the pentatonic shapes, the uh, pentatonic major shape, let me outline it for you real briefly. Uh, close up on my left hand, you'll see the shape. You might recognize this song. It's just a fragment of a song called My Girl. I can't remember who did it, Temptations or somebody. And it's a, a very happy type feel, and it's a little bit different than what we just did. So having said that, we're going to go through a short version. Here it is. Okay, now, once again, I already outlined the shape, and you'll see the notation in front of you as far as uh, giving you the exact notes. But once again, look at the uh, shape starting on the D, 10th fret, E string. Let's zero in on the left hand here. You do that once, then you switch over and do it in the same shape, same scale, except starting on F. back. You do this a total of four times. This would be the third one. Once more. Now the walk up, D, E, twice, G, once on the A, repeat. That's just a song fragment of that, uh, that tune. Now we're going to do a longer version where, uh, in the same manner, we'll go through that twice. I'll play it uh, the first time, and you should stop and, and make sure you know this pattern before you go to play along, obviously. The second time what I'll do is uh, let Ange have it. In other words, I'd like for you, after you, the first time, you'll be looking at my fingers, so you just follow along. The next time, I want you to actually 
you know, like I said earlier, uh, the ball's in your court, so you're holding the bass down. Remember, long notes as opposed to, remember that phrasing, the importance of that. And uh, you're going to play along with Angelo. And so I kind of want you to see, you know, what it looks like when you're playing with a guitar player. So the second time, it's with you, the drum machine, and Ange. And here we go, the long version. Okay, now we're going to do an entirely different type feel. You rockers will appreciate this. This is the key, uh, the key of E. We're going to use a little bit different rhythm than we have uh, up to this point. You're going to like it, and there's some guitar and bass interplay in that we do a line together. This is based on an E minor scale, or you could look at it like E minor pentatonic with one exception, that being the uh, F sharp or G flat. Anyway, here's the short version. Okay, and that, as you could see, it was a, a much heavier grunge type of feel. And uh, the first thing we do is just you play those groups of two twice. And keep in mind that they're not legato in that they're the second one is, is uh, they're both eighth notes, just then the next part, which is the um, part that is played in unison, I'll show you the left hand, and the notes are Just four notes, D, B, A, G. And that's the part that's done in unison with the guitar. Now we repeat that four times. Then the next section, the last pattern, part of the pattern, is just eight eighth notes on the G. And I'll show you the left hand fingering I, I suggest using. Four on the G flat. Then over to the B for one. And then there's a rest after that. Okay, and so now we're going to go through the long version. You played along with me the first time, then you played along with the drums and Angelo the second time through. And here we go. Okay, now, by the way, I need to, to fill you in on something. On My Girl, you may have detected when we went to Angelo, two guitar parts going on. That's just how good this guy is. Now, Angelo was playing the chords on My Girl two songs ago. And just to keep you guys in line, we had Mike Atkinson, guitar player over on the side, 
playing the melody, which was the same as the bass line, just to kind of keep you in line. So if you heard two things, it was not your, your imagination. Okay, now let's go to the last thing. And this is kind of a triplet type feel. So this is an entirely different feel. And first I want to give you a preparatory exercise just to kind of get the hang of this uh, swing type, type uh, groove. Here's the exercise. And all I want you to play, since this one's going to be basically out of uh, G minor, go ahead and use a G note on the left hand. The importance here is watching the right hand and you're playing uh, in kind of a triplet feel in groups of uh, two. This will kind of get you used to the feel that I'm looking for. Here's the exercise. Just play along. Now, and hopefully if you can set up a, a drum machine or something with that same type of feel, or rewind the tape and play along with me. It's important to get those right in the pocket. Bump, 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 bump. Kind of like a feel of a song Journey did a few years ago. Can't remember the name of it. In any event, this next song has uh, got that kind of feel. Not exactly, but we're playing in kind of a triplet feel. And here is the short version. Okay, what's going on there, taking it a piece at a time, you're back on that G. Now, it doesn't go on that long, but that's in groups of three. So you might want to get yourself used to or acclimated to that feel. In the exercise that I did as a prep exercise, it was actually, now we're just adding. Okay, here's the actual pattern. Okay, let me show you those three notes, and let me introduce you to hammer-ons. That's where you play, you fret one note and play it with the right hand. The second note is being produced totally by the strength of the hammer-on of a higher finger or onto a higher fret. It can be any, by definition, it can be any fret higher in any finger, but for now, keep in mind you're plucking only the first one, and you produce the second one with the left-hand hammer-on. Now stay where you're at, and the third note there is where you just switch over. The notes are D, C, G. So, repeat, and also you want to keep in mind that notes were kept kind of short on the G. And then when we, the second half of the pattern, B flat, C, F, F sharp, and then it starts repeating again. Now keep this in mind. When we go to the B flat, keep in mind the notes are long. C. Okay, now we're going to do the long version of that. I'll, once again, I'll play the first. You play it and match me note for note, and then the ball's in your court the second time through. Here we go. And there you have that. Okay, that's going to wrap up this video, part two. 
Once again, let me give you a couple of bits of advice. Practice everything on the tape. Listen to lots of styles of music. Make yourself versatile. Practice hard. Don't do drugs. I mean it. And uh, the more you put into it, once again, the more you get out of it. If you love the instrument like I do and like Angelo does, then you're going to invest a lot of time at getting good and being as versatile as you can. Having said all that, let me say that I'm going to be doing a, in an intermediate series two videos, part one and two, shortly, as well as a slap technique thing for absolute beginning uh, slap players. And that's going to be coming up shortly. So once again, I'm Beaver Felton for Super Chops for Bass, and I'll see you on the next one.